All right. Hello and welcome to PMP Live. I'm Alan Watke, an event coordinator with Politics and Prose. Thank you for joining us in this new format where we continue to bring you the authors you love and their new books to the Politics and Prose community. At any time during the event, you can click on the green button below to purchase Ben Sheehan's book on Politics and Prose website. Our physical stores are closed and we need your online purchases in order to keep bringing you the programming PMP is known for. Um, tonight, you can ask the author a question by clicking on ask a question, which can be found near the bottom of your screen. You can also read other people's questions and even vote for ones you'd like to hear answered the most. Um, unlike our in-person events, the author, host, and audience members cannot see you through the screen. So feel empowered to stay in your com comfy clothes and just without judgment, you're good. Uh, finally, we want to thank you all for being here with us tonight. We're so thankful to our family of loyal customers keeping our business and our spirits afloat. Uh, today, I'm very pleased to welcome Ben Sheehan to, P to PMP Live for his new book, OMG, WTF, Does the Constitution Actually Say? a non-boring guide to how our democracy is supposed to work. Sheehan is a former award-winning executive producer at Funny or Die, and he founded uh, OMG WTF, which is Ohio, Michigan, Georgia, Wisconsin, Texas, Florida, to teach voters about state ex executive races during the 2018 midterms. Um, ben has been featured in Adweek, Billboard, BuzzFeed, The Daily Beast, Fast Company, among others, and was named Next Gen 35 Rising Executives Under 35 by The Hollywood Reporter in 2018. And he also authored um, OMG WTF is Gerrymandering, a journal for concerned citizens. Joining Ben in conversation tonight is Congressman Jamie Raskin representing Maryland's 8th District. Uh, he has authored several books, including the Washington Post bestseller, Overruling Democracy, The Supreme Court versus the American People, and the highly acclaimed We the Students, Supreme Court Cases for and About America's Students. Um, and so without further ado, please welcome to your screens and PMP Live, Ben Sheehan and Congressman Jamie Raskin. Thank you, Alan. Um Ben, is it my turn? Am I getting this right? It's your turn. You're kicking okay. it off. Cool. Well, look, Alan, thank you for the lovely introduction. Ben, thank you for inviting me to talk about the Constitution and your very wonderful new book, uh, which I had a chance to uh, speed read the other night. And uh, I find it totally invigorating and fresh and engaging um, and intricate and substantive. And you provide a totally fresh um departure for thinking about the Constitution for lots of people who would, you know, who don't make a livelihood out of it, uh, but who need to understand it. So uh, I think your book is going to see phenomenal success. And thank you for uh, popularizing um, our most important document or what at least used to be our most um, important document. And I thought that um, I would, as a way of uh, introducing you and your book, I would talk for just a few minutes um, about we the people and how that phrase frames um, everything that follows. And um, I should uh, lay my uh, cards on the table and my heart on my sleeve by explaining, of course, that uh, I'm a member of Congress. I represent Maryland's uh, eighth district. I represent the great Sheehan family. Ben Sheehan is a, a native son, a favorite son of Maryland, and I assume all the Sheehans, at least your mom and dad, Ricky and Michael Sheehan, are watching tonight. So hello to the Sheehans who are with us. Um, I'm also a big fan of politics and prose and have been a member of politics and prose for a long, long, long time. And um, and often will just show up and start browsing for books. And uh, Alan, you were kind to mention uh, some of my books. I used to write books. Now I write tweets. But one day, one can dream. I'll, I'll get back into uh, I'll get back into the the literature business. But um, so look, here, here's what I wanted to say. Our constitution has been through two stress tests. And one stress test was with impeachment. And it was really about the separation of powers and whether Congress could reassert its central and preeminent role in the system of government. And um, we got halfway there with the House of Representatives and everything fell apart um, in the Senate. 
Um, now what is being uh, tested is American federalism, the relationship between the federal government and the states, and whether the original constitutional vision and principles can be vindicated at this moment uh, when the president of the United States is essentially pitting the states of the union against each other in a ruthless, bitter competition for resources, for material, um, for the medical equipment that, that the states need to save our people from this terrible uh, coronavirus. Um, <clears throat> the system of federalism is also being tested because the central government uh, and specifically the president um, have completely abdicated any authority and responsibility for actually addressing the crisis. And the president has just um, bounced back and forth between pretending he's King Kong and he can do whatever he wants and he can order the governor to order the counties and the cities to order the businesses to reopen and he's in charge here to the next day going back to his usual mode of just being a TV watcher and an innocent bystander where he sort of uh, grades the governors on their different performance, meaning he grades them on uh, how well they are uh, performing as sycophants uh, to the president and how much they're praising the president. This is not a formula for reopening America. It is not uh, a recipe for getting us back on our feet. We've been brought to our knees by this president. And I think that we do need to recover some basic constitutional principles. So let's go back to uh, a year ago when what we were fighting about uh, was the president's complete um, subverting of the constitutional design by ignoring Congress, ignoring explicit instructions given to him by Congress um, in sending hundreds of millions of dollars of aid to the people of Ukraine to resist Russian aggression. And the president decided that he had a better idea than that, <clears throat> which is uh, to hold up the money and to work instead with Vladimir Putin to subdue and to control <clears throat> the new president of Ukraine, excuse me, <clears throat> um, and to get the new president of Ukraine uh, involved in American politics by having him uh, essentially come over to America through the television um, to uh, participate in a series of lies about Joe Biden and to say that, that the Ukrainian government was investigating um, Joe Biden. And so this sort of for different purposes. Um, this undermined Joe Biden, which is what the president had in mind. It derailed the military uh, equipment and the military aid that Vladimir Putin didn't want. And then the other part of the deal, of course, was to revive the discredited uh, Russian-baked conspiracy theory that it was not Putin who had interfered in the 2016 election by um, hacking into the DNC and hacking into the DCCC and hacking into Hillary Clinton's computers. It was actually Ukraine which had done it. Okay, so um, the Congress began to investigate and then the president essentially pulled a curtain down over the executive branch of government and said he would refuse to cooperate with any investigations uh, by Congress. He would refuse uh, to participate um, in any hearings. He would uh, tell anybody in the executive branch not to go. Um, he would threaten to fire anybody who tried to go and testify before Congress. He refused and rejected all of the subpoenas. This was a complete defeat of the constitutional design of Congress having the oversight power over the entire government. As James Madison uh, put it, that knowledge will forever govern ignorance, and those who mean to be their own governors must arm themselves with the power that knowledge gives. And so the Supreme Court had always understood that Congress had the right to get whatever information it wants from anybody, including the president and the executive branch of government, in order to do the legislation, which is Congress's role. So let's use that as an opportunity to get back to we the people. Now, we the people is the phrase that kicks off the one sentence preamble to the Constitution. In law school, the professors always ignore the preamble because they don't view it as positive law. You can't sue somebody uh, under... Uh, the preamble, but it's actually the critical framing device for informing the meaning of the whole document. So we, the people, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and preserve to ourselves and our posterity the blessings of liberty,
do hereby ordain and establish the Constitution of the United States of America. Okay, there in one you know, action-packed uh, sentence, we have the whole meaning of why we have a government. Now, check it out. The very next sentence in Article 1 is, all legislative power is vested in the Congress of the United States of America, the Senate. And so what just happened there? The sovereign power of the people to create the Constitution, the country, and the government flowed immediately where? To the president? To the Supreme Court? No. Immediately to the Congress, the representatives of the people. And then you get this comprehensive and detailed recitation of all the powers that Congress had in Article 1, Section 8, the power to regulate interstate commerce, the power to uh, coin money and currency, the power to tax, the power to spend, uh, the power to raise armies, to maintain a navy, the power to regulate the district that is to become the seat of government by the cession of particular lands to Congress, and on and on and on. And then in Article 1, Section 8, Clause 18, and all other powers necessary and proper to the execution of the foregoing powers. So not just all of these enumerated powers, but all other powers necessary and proper to those powers. Then, after all of that, you come to Article 2, the president's powers, right? And what do you get? Four short sections, and the fourth section is all about impeachment. How you impeach a president. Now, notice, the Congress has the power to impeach the president for uh, for treason, bribery, and other high crimes and misdemeanors. The president does not have the power to impeach the Congress. The sovereign power of the people through their representatives is the basic and organic power of the government. What's the president's job? Well, very simple. Aside from being the commander in chief of the army and navy, not of the government or the nation, but the army and navy in times of actual war and insurrection, when he can also call up um, the state militias. In addition to that, his principal primary job is to take care that the laws are faithfully executed, not violated, not trampled, not circumnavigated, not avoided, not rewritten, but that the laws are faithfully enforced. The fault laws are faithfully implemented, faithfully executed. That's the president's job. OK, so we had a constitutional collision over this because we thought the president clearly was not executing the laws as written. The president was running away with the power and then refusing to allow Congress even to do oversight, to conduct oversight operations in a completely unprecedented move, trying to categorically reject uh, the legislative oversight power of the Congress. All right. So he gets away with it um, because of the U.S. Senate. Um, which in its wisdom um, the, rejected uh, the charges that were voted out of the House of Representatives. Remember, he was impeached um, and I would say discredited and disgraced uh, by the House of Representatives through a very thorough, comprehensive investigation to everything that the president had done. But the Senate uh, decided not to convict, so he remained president. Well, um, then we get the coronavirus crisis. And interestingly, it, during the impeachment proceedings, a number of members were saying what the president did in the Ukraine shakedown has a domestic corollary in a hypothetical disaster situation where uh, disaster aid is being distributed to different states. And the president says, well, you'll get the aid, but do us a favor, though. And the favor is we'd like you to render some praise or some compliments to the president or endorse my campaign or whatever. Um, we're, we're obviously not far from that scenario. And I think there were a lot of uh, hypotheticals that we invoked at that time, many of which touched on the nightmare that has actually come to befall the republic under the president's um, lethal negligence, indifference, and recklessness um, in responding to the coronavirus. So we've been brought to our knees in this situation. Um, and the basic problem is that the president boss everyone around and has no concept of actually how American federalism is supposed to work. So the Congress is supposed to be able to develop laws that the president uh, enforces to assist and aid 
the people in the states. The federal government belongs to the people. The state governments belong to the people. And those different uh, levels of government should be cooperating to advance the common good. And so uh, I'll just close with this thought, Ben, um, because, uh, you know, I've joined this new oversight committee that Speaker Pelosi um, advanced uh, on coronavirus uh, oversight. And I'd introduced legislation with uh, my friend Donna Shalala, who was the secretary of HHS in the Clinton administration, uh, and with Hakeem Jeffries, who's the chairman of our caucus, whose district in New York has been brutally hit uh, by, um, by this pandemic, um, and 70 other members now. Um, but w- what our legislation says, the Reopen America Act, is number one, the federal government will take responsibility for the production of all of the equipment we need, rather than pitting the states against each other, rather than pouncing on shipments that are coming into particular states and seizing them for the central government, um, we will take responsibility for seeing that all of the state governments and their political subdivisions receive the PPEs, the gowns and the masks and the ventilators that our people need to survive this crisis, okay? Number one. Number two, we'll create a scientific advisory panel to make sure that we are developing um, and then deploying the best um, testing kits that are available, um, as well as all of the other scientific technology that we need. Um, and then we are, we'll invite all of the states to uh, apply for funding for reopening in their state once they've met two conditions that the scientists and public health experts tell us need to be met. Number one, the hospitals have got to be able to absorb the shock of the crisis and to deal with all of the medical demand. Number two, the um, transmission rate, the infection rate has to be below one, meaning it's on the way downward. It's at 0.8 or 0.7 or 0.2. Then we got the virus on the run. Then we're going to be able to beat it. As opposed to 1.3, 1.8, 2.0, then you've got a pandemic situation. So once they've done sufficient social distancing to bring it down to a manageable state, then they apply for reopening. And our scientists at the HHS and other parts of the government, Center for Disease Control, will work together to say, that looks good, but do this or do that, you know, to make recommendations, but we'll approve it within seven days. So we're talking about a very fast process. And then the federal government will pay for it. But the basis of it has got to be a mass nationwide regime of testing that's implemented through the states in a partnership between the national government and the states. So we're testing the population, which is the only thing that has worked in the absence of a vaccine around the world. Then we will have militant contact tracing. We got 30 million unemployed people in America right now been thrown out of work uh, by the coronavirus. Um, We've got you know, several million college kids about to graduate this summer into a very bleak economy. We've got to hire these people to become an army of contact tracers around the country. So the minute we find out somebody's got it, we immediately interview them on the phone, everybody they've been in touch with. And then we get in touch with those people to make sure they're quarantining and we get them tested. That's how we're going to get the virus on the run and get serious about it. But you know, We've lost 62,000 people. We've lost more people in the last three months than the United States of America lost in more than a decade of the Vietnam War. We have more than 1.2 million cases now, and it could be as high as double that because we basically told people when if they call up to the hospital, I think I've got it, I think I'm sick, they basically say, well, there's nothing we can do for you, so unless you get really, really sick and you can't breathe, you stay at home and then they don't get tested. And if they're not tested, they're not even part of the numbers. Uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez told me she thinks that there are tens of thousands of people in her district who have it, who've never been tested, who are not counted. So we're talking about a crisis that has really gotten out of control under this president's misleadership and misdirection and constant uh, you know, parroting of right-wing propaganda and provocations and antics with the media. So uh, we need a real plan. And again, Congress needs to stand up. I hope the House of Representatives, and I trust we will do it in the House of Representatives. We are the people's house. I hope this time the Senate gets it right 
so we can vindicate the genius of the American founders in the Federalist design and show that the American system of government can work despite this president with his truly lethal incompetence and derangement. So with that, I'm, I'm sorry to introduce you on a, on a <coughs> negative note there, Ben, but I still, I love your book. It's exactly what we need and we need everybody talking about the constitution. Hmm. Well, thank you so much, Representative. Um, I, you know, I, I, I've learned so much about this, this document, uh, uh, talking with you about it. Um, and just to sort of give a quick background of why I wrote this book. Um, I grew up in Washington, DC, and I had the privilege of having parents who worked in and around government. And what that meant is that I would uh, basically get to learn about the government um, at home over dinner. I remember when I was six years old and my mom uh, one night at dinner took a napkin and wrote down, uh, well, she drew two houses uh, and wrote the number 101 and 435 in the other. And you know, I started learning about Congress and, and, and what it did and how it, how it worked. Um, it wasn't until I got older that I realized that that is, that is not just a rare thing um, because of having the privilege of having parents who grew up in government, but it's actually a rare thing to learn about the government at all. Um, when I founded OMGWTF, one of the things we would do is we'd throw events and we'd try to educate young people, and by young people I mean 20s and 30s, about how government works. And what we would do is we would have uh, live events and I would speak and we were supporting governors, secretaries of state and attorneys general and saying, you know, there are these really important roles at the state level that have a huge impact on your life and you may not be familiar with it. What I wasn't anticipating is that people were coming to the events thinking I was talking about US secretaries of state, US attorneys general. They were thinking they'd hear information about Rex Tillerson at the time or Jeff Sessions. Uh, they didn't even know they had a secretary of state at their state level. They didn't know they had an attorney general at the state level. And this is a product of the fact that we have been cutting civics education in our schools for years, for decades. Back in the 1960s, it was very common to have civics classes, a class called Foundations of Democracy, uh, American government, US history. Today, only eight states are required to teach a year of government and civics. And it is a far, far cry or a, a huge fall from something that was so core to our education. Even if the founding fathers knew how important this was in his 1796 speech, uh, his State of the Union, act Union actually, George Washington talked about the need to create a national university prioritizing civics, specifically talking about how important it was that people understand the government that he and his friends just set up. And today only eight states are requiring it. So, you know, I think for younger people, uh, you know, millennials and Gen Z, we've kind of been going around thinking about uh, government as something we don't really understand and feeling a lot of shame for not understanding it. We sort of carry this embarrassment that we don't really know what the House does. We don't exactly know what our governor does. We don't really know who our representatives are. And I wanted to, to, to write something that would help explain this, not in a pedantic way, not in a way that would make somebody feel stupid, but almost like a peer bringing you up to a speed or somebody explaining how the government works over drinks. And I remember getting out, uh, uh, I, I have still saved my eighth grade copy of the US Constitution, the, the one year of government class I was mandated to take, and I went to school in DC. Uh, uh, so, you know, that's, that's something, but um, I got a, a pocket constitution. I remember picking up and reading it last year and going, this is extremely inaccessible. Um, it's very hard to understand the way it's written, um, uh, you know, in the time and the dialect. If there was a way to take it and make it more accessible and present the information in a new way, uh, maybe that might have an effect. So that's sort of why I wrote this book. Um, and there are a lot of things that I learned about this country that I had no idea about. And I would like to share a, a few of them. Uh, one is uh, uh, the importance of uh, the congressman's job. I think growing up, we are, I don't want to say lied to, uh, especially since I have some teachers watching. Uh, I don't think it's a, it's, a, it's a malicious thing, but I think we are taught uh, the, the branches of government in an uh, inaccurate way. As long as I can remember, I've been hearing that we have three co-equal branches of government. Uh, that is not true. Reading the Constitution, it's very clear that checks and balances is not the same thing as having three equal branches of government. 
they can check each other and, and, and stop each other and need to get permission from each other in different ways, but the power is not equally distributed. It's very clear that the framers intended for the, the, the Congress to have the most power. And you have 10 sections in Article 1, and as, as the congressman said, talking about all the things they can do, declare war, co coin money, regulate trade. I mean, so many things, the power lies in Congress. And when you think about it, this actually makes a lot of sense. Because who were the people that designed this government? What, what country did most of them come from? What was this government created in, in response to? And in response to uh, a monarchy, we created this representative democracy, democratic republic. There are all di different types of words we can use. But the idea is that the power doesn't rest in one person who passes it down through bloodline. It rests in a number of people. In fact, one person having a lot of power is exactly what the writers of the Constitution were trying to avoid. It was the representatives of the people that were the ones who had the power uh, to be elected by the people. Although in the beginning, we didn't elect senators uh, uh, directly and it was the state legislatures that did that. And in 1913, the 17th Amendment uh, granted uh, people uh, the, the ability to elect uh, senators directly provided they could uh, uh, or allowed to elect uh, members of their state house. So this is something that we have sort of gained over time, uh, uh, more democracy in, in, in many ways. But I think it's fundamental to understanding the government is understanding where the power lies and so much of it lies in, uh, lies in Congress. And you know, before we get into to questions and, 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 answer, and answer some of them, you know, there's one thing that I really wanna talk about that has come up over and over, over again in my reading of the constitution. Uh, and that is voter suppression. Voter suppression is something that is top of mind. And I want to sort of give a, an anecdote back to when I was uh, uh, doing um, uh, stuff with, OM, with OMG during the election cycle. In 2018, November 6th, I believe, it was on election day, and I went to Georgia. And I and my uh, uh, um, fellow colleagues, uh, we drove people to the polls. Uh, we knocked on doors. We helped do GOTV stuff. And I remember one experience that has really stuck with me and, and honestly scarred me and, and made me very sad is that we went to two polling places on election day and one of them was in a, a mostly white uh, precinct and there was maybe a 20 minute line uh, to vote and we passed out food and snacks to people waiting in line and then we drove to another polling place that was majority african-american and this is the same county by the way and we show up and we arrive and in front of us were 400 people waiting in line, I would say 95% of them were African-American. They had been waiting for three to four hours to vote. Uh, upon further inspection, when we walked in, we found out that there were many voting machines that were working and available, 14 machines. But for whatever reason, the orders from the County Board of Elections said that they could only use three machines. There were many election personnel uh, from the county uh, there to help check in voters, but the orders were only two people to check in voters. Uh, at one point, they turned off the AC, and we had to go and get fans to bring out fans and turn them on so that people were able to wait in line. This is 2018. This is Jim Crow era level voter suppression. And it was very scarring and, and jarring to see this. And I almost, I feel like I, I'm naive to think that this is happening for so long, but there are a few things that led to this. Uh, chiefly is, is one, um, in 2013, uh, there was a famous court case called Shelby County versus Holder that, that some of you may be familiar with, where uh, uh, the Supreme Court uh, struck down a uh, part of the Voting Rights Act. By the way, uh, a fun fact that I learned reading this uh, or, or researching this book and writing it uh, is that the Supreme Court's power to strike down laws or parts of laws if they think they're constitutional isn't in the Constitution. We started doing this in the early 1800s uh, by the precedent set by uh, the case Marbury versus Madison, and this is not uh, a constitutional power of the Supreme Court, which I think is really interesting, something we've always taken and granted and just assumed is in there, but isn't. Um, but basically, having part of this law struck down means that states no longer had to get permission from the federal government uh, in order to change their, uh, their, their laws around voting. And this specifically applied to states um, that had previously discriminated against certain voters. Uh, and in the hours after this, Texas passed a strict voter ID law. You saw states, um, uh, you know, one after the other implementing uh, these voter ID laws, uh, kicking people off of voting uh, rolls. 
I mean, all these new forms of suppression, but the idea of it being suppression uh, is as old as the constitution itself. And you look back to the, the beginning of article one and how it shows that, you know, some people aren't counted the same as other people. If you are a free person uh, or someone working for a fixed period of servitude, uh, you count as one. If you are a Native American that doesn't pay taxes, you don't count at all. Uh, everyone else, which was their code way of saying slaves, counted as 60% of a person. Uh, and you can track voter suppression and the lack of counting uh, uh, um, equally uh, among uh, constituents through the entire constitution. One of the most interesting things I found is that the constitution doesn't specifically say who can and can't vote. It says that you can't have your vote taken away if you're a citizen based on your race, based on your sex, uh, based on uh, whether or not you were previously a slave, based on you being 18 or older. But it doesn't specifically say only these people can vote, only these people can vote is because they left it up to the states. And between learning that secretaries of state in 2018 were you know, the, the chief elections officers in, in 37 states and had all this power, even the person who is now the governor of Georgia who ran uh, while he was the sitting secretary of state uh, you know, if the if the congressman and I decided to run for a uh, 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 governor of, of Maryland and I controlled the elections for both of us, theoretically, I could cheat. And that is exactly I, I wouldn't. But uh, that is exactly what the uh, now governor of Georgia did. And you look at the, the 14th Amendment, which is the root of or one of the roots, I should say, of felony disenfranchisement, uh, where if states if states prevented uh, men who were 21 and older who were eligible to vote from voting, they were penalized. They were decreased. Their states got uh, had a, a, a shorter, smaller population basis for their representatives. Um, technically, people of, of color, uh, former slaves, could vote, but states could still prevent them. They would just get a penalty. And so the 15th Amendment then said, okay, well, no, you cannot prevent a U.S. citizen from voting based on their race to their previous condition of servitude. And we've, we've added all these amendments preventing people who already have voting rights from having them taken away based on this account. But there's nothing in the Constitution that says that you can't vote if you aren't a citizen. Um, the Congressman and I talked about this. There were many dozens of states that for many years allowed non-citizens to vote. Uh, some, some local uh, uh, governments still let uh, non-citizens to vote. I believe, I believe some of them are in Maryland. Uh, there are some local governments that allow 16-year-olds to vote. Um, I couldn't get it out of my head that the Constitution can be read as a timeline of voter suppression. And voter suppression is something that is so core to what has been happening recently. When you have uh, elected leaders who aren't representative of, of, the, of their constituents or, or, or the people as a whole, you know, it makes you scratch your head and, and wonder why that is. And there are so many different mechanisms. And that's an, another reason why I wrote uh, the book about gerrymandering as a companion piece, because this year, we have a really crucial election for, for state legislatures. In most states, the state legislature draws the lines. And this is the last chance to elect people who are going to hopefully draw fair lines. So that those lines last for 10 years. And that's the next five uh, elections for the US House and for state legislatures. So looking at the roots of voter suppression and seeing how old it is and where it starts. And I think it's not just voter suppression, but so many other things that we either take for granted or that we uh, assume, you know, our, our modern problems, you can see the roots in the Constitution. And I think that, and I'll, I'll end and open up to questions by, by saying this, is that it is a fallacy to say that the Constitution is supposed to stay the same. It's a fallacy to say that our, our founders didn't intend us for us. It didn't intend for us to change this. Uh, the entirety of Article 5 talks about the amendment process. They wanted us to amend this. In fact, there was a letter of correspondence between Thomas Jefferson and James Madison uh, right around when the Constitution was, was written, where Thomas Jefferson thought that we should rewrite the Constitution every 19 years. He compared it to uh, you know, keeping the same coat from when you were a child and expecting it to fit you 19 years later. You know, morals change, mores change, societies change, people change. And the Constitution should change with them to reflect that. And that's why we have the amendment process. So anyone who tells you that it's supposed to stay exactly as it was uh, back in the day. Um, you know, is, is, that's that's they're either misinformed or they're lying to you. And this is something that we need to 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 realize and and to understand that if we want to change something, if we want to make something more modern, if we want to update it so that everyone is able 
to have equal rights, able to uh, uh, cast votes, able to make their voices heard, uh, then we need to change that and, and we're supposed to change it. So I hope that this book serves as an entry point for people who are frustrated about politics, who may not know how the government works, who are scared right now, who are curious, who are wondering what's going on. Um, you know, this is the book I, I would have wanted when I was uh, uh, in, in growing up to, to sort of explain it um, in an accessible way. And I hope that what people do is not just learn about how the government works and learn about how, what their vote actually means, but use this as a launching point to get involved, not just with voting, but to make sure that your representatives are accurately representing you, to make sure that once we give them their jobs, they represent us. Because I've always thought about government as sort of the inverse of a private company. In a private company, you have a few people at the top who are the boss of many at the bottom. Government's the opposite. You have many people at the top who are the boss of a few people because much like bosses, we decide if we wanna hire them, we interview candidates for the jobs on campaign, our tax dollars pay their salaries, their benefits, their expenses, and then every two to four to six years, we decide if they we want to rehire them. And we need to take that responsibility seriously. It's not just about paying attention to campaign ads and debates and uh, what's trending on social media and who said this, but once people have their jobs, how do we make sure they're doing it well? And hopefully the tools or the, the starter toolkit is in this book. Um, and I'm so you know indebted to people who have been doing this work a lot longer than I have, uh, like the congressman who has been educating people for, for years about this topic and this subject and has been helping to make it more accessible and helping to make people have a better understanding of this founding document because this is not just getting people to vote in a single election cycle. Uh, this is people teaching people to be uh, citizens and participants and to vote for the rest of their lives. So um, I hope that you know it resonates and people share this information. Um, and I guess we can open it up to, uh, to questions if people wanna, um, uh, people have any thoughts or questions. Hey, Ben, we've done everything, but you haven't shown them your book. That's true. I, yeah, by functioning also as a publicist. This is the book. This is the cover. Um, that's James Madison uh, dropping uh, papers of the Constitution. Um, and then this is the uh, gerrymandering journal. So you can write your thoughts and ideas maybe about how to fix democracy in that, uh, in that journal. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ben. That was fantastic. Um, we, we do have we do have quite a few questions here um, and we can start with um, let's see let's go with um, how does the declaration play in proper use of the Constitution um, well I'd love to know I mean I'd love to have the, the congressman offer his, his, his thoughts and, and and advice as well um, one is that, you know, the declaration is an idea. I've always found it strange that the declaration, you know, we, we celebrate Independence Day uh, as when we declared our independence. It's not actually when we got it. Um, when we stood up and said, we should have this. And everyone's like, yeah, great, we got it. We didn't get it until, you know, seven years later, officially in, in 1980 or 1783. Um, so the, the Declaration of Independence is sort of the, the first thought and the idea. Um, but it's the precursor in many ways, and there are some things that are in the Declaration of Independence that, that made it into the Constitution and some that didn't. One thing that didn't that I think is really interesting is there's no mention of God in the Constitution. Uh, in fact, the document specifically takes, uh, uh, makes an effort to avoid establishing a religion. It prevents Congress from establishing a religion. You can't be made to take a religious test in order to hold federal office. So, you know, we sometimes hear, you know, God and, and religion and being forced into this document, it, but it went out of its way to not establish that because who are the people that came over and, and settled the colonies early on? We're, we're seeking, we're fleeing religious persecution. So there are some elements of the declaration that carried over, you know, uh, certain rights to, to, to life and, and liberty and, and, um, and in the constitution property, but it's, something that I think was the idea or sort of just paving the road and then the constitution is actually the meat of the, uh, and, the and, and the work that was done to fulfill it. And but I just want to add to that the kind of um, the Abraham Lincoln perspective on it because you know when he gave the Gettysburg Address in 1863 when he said four score and seven years ago if you add that up the, the 87 years and subtracted from 1863 it doesn't 
take you to 1787. It's not the Constitution. It's 1776. It's the Declaration of Independence. Um, and, uh, you know, he basically said uh, that the, the South was infuriated by the speech because in the Gettysburg Address, um, you know, he said that uh, you know, four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth this continent, a uh, new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. So he took from the Declaration um, the avowal of interest in liberty and equality, that, um, that you know, these are our uh, inalienable rights that we have. And um, the, there's some very interesting historical literature about how the South said that the country got its pocket pick there with Lincoln going back to the Declaration because the Declaration doesn't have any legal standing. It's not positive law. It's the Constitution that governs. But what Lincoln did essentially was to take the best part of the Declaration, which was the articulation of these values of uh, all men, and now today we think women, uh, being created equal and having these inalienable rights, um, and then saying the Constitution, like the Articles of Confederation before it, like the Articles of Association before that, are just attempts to work out the meaning of liberty and equality, but those are the real meaning of the country. And I think in the Bill of Rights and in the Reconstruction Amendments, especially um, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, um, the spirit of the Declaration was recaptured and embodied in this dynamic, growing, evolving, living Constitution. And Ben is absolutely right to direct our attention to the fact that if you look at the constitutional amendments since the Bill of Rights, there have been 17 amendments, and the vast majority of them have been democracy expanding, suffrage um, extending, uh, democracy deepening amendments. They, and they do chart the progressive course of American uh, politics with the expansion of the vote um, against race discrimination in the 15th Amendment, the 14th Amendment gave us equal protection, the 17th Amendment uh, extended uh, the right of the people to elect U.S. senators, taking it away from the state legislatures. The 19th Amendment gave us women's suffrage, uh, whose birthday it is this year, whose centennial anniversary is 2020. Um, the 23rd Amendment gave our friends in D.C. the right to participate in presidential elections. The 24th Amendment abolished poll taxes in federal elections. The 6th Amendment lowered the voting age to 18. But Ben is right to say all of those it's kind of this ragtag series of ad hoc anti-discrimination amendments, but nowhere do you get what you find in most de modern democratic constitutions, like if you look in the, South, the new South African constitution, that all citizens have the right to vote at every level of government, to have their votes counted, and to participate in government at every level, which is why people in Washington lost in their lawsuit, Alexander versus Daley, saying we should be represented in Congress. And the Supreme Court came back and said, well, no taxation without representation is a great slogan, but it's not in the Constitution. If you've got a right to vote, the right has got to be written down in one of those amendments, or you've got to belong to a state. And people in D.C., like people in Puerto Rico and other territories, don't belong to states, which is why we have millions of people who still aren't represented. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so uh, Juanita asks, so Ben, uh, what is the, the impetus behind writing your book? The impetus uh, about behind writing this book is that, you know, I, I, and I kind of alluded to this earlier, is that we've, we've really cut civics education in schools. And we've been doing this for decades. And there's a huge discrepancy between how much of a part of our public education civics was in the 50s and 60s and how much of a part of it is, is today. As I mentioned earlier, only eight states require a year of government or civics education. And I was noticing through my work in 2018 and, and, and before that and after that is that a lot of my, my peers, I'm, I'm, I'll out myself, I'm 35, um, a lot of my peers, uh, fellow millennials and uh, uh, younger people, Generation Z, didn't understand the basics. And it, it's, again, it's not their fault. It's that, you know, we are now, I should say, uh, the millennial generation as of December 31st, uh, 2019, uh, it's now the, old, the largest adult generation in the United States. Uh, there are 73 million millennials and 72 million uh, baby boomers. And I think it's, it's unique and strange 
that the largest adult generation today uh, has so little of a command on the fundamentals of how government works. And so I thought I wanted to start at the, the beginning with the, with the basics, the document that governs all of us and sort of start with the constitution um, and explain it in a way so that people understand, you know, what, where, where, where their rights come from and, and how things work. Because in order to make a change, in order to effectively participate in, in democracy and government, it helps to understand how it works. It helps to know who does what. What does the Senate have the power to do? What does Congress have the power to do? What's left up to the states? And only by having a better understanding of that are we able to effectively participate. So that's sort of the the impetus behind this. And you know, it's it's hard to read the Constitution. It's not. It's not. Um, you know, it feels very dated. It feels very inaccessible. And so this is information that we all, I believe. We all have a right to understand what's in this. And so hopefully this book takes this, uh, this information and presents it through a bit of a different lens, um, uh, a more modern lens and accessible one. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, Susan um, asks if you could address the Electoral College. Um, well, I'll definitely uh, 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 kick it over to the congressman uh, after this, but my own personal thoughts on the Electoral College, and I have a whole section on it um, in this book, is that uh, it's very interesting how it works today. Because in, back in when it was being written, there was far less of, you know, lops. I mean, there, there were states that were larger than others, but today you have such a lopsided um, uh, approach to, to, to states and their population. I mean, the state of Texas, if you were to take the electoral votes that, that Texas has, which as right now, Texas has 38 electoral votes for 36 representatives and its two senators. And after this redistricting round, it's probably gonna get more. Texas is actually the fastest growing state in the country. Um, if you were to take the voting age population uh, and uh, divide that by the number of electoral votes, there would be one electoral vote for every 550,000 voting age residents of Texas. If you were to do the same thing for Wyoming, which has three uh, electoral votes, and use that to divide the population, which is a little over 500,000, uh, that is about 140,000 voting age residents per electoral vote. So by that metric, your vote is 75%, 73% less uh, uh, impactful uh, in Texas than it is in Wyoming. That's a huge discrepancy uh, the, of that one electoral vote correlating to so many more people. And I personally think that this is long in need of an update. I think that it's weird to realize when I was writing this book that we don't actually have the right to vote for president in the constitution. There's nowhere that says that people have the right to directly vote for, for their president. In fact, we don't technically have the right to vote for the electors for president. It's up to the state legislatures. They, for a long time, it wasn't until 1880 that every state going forward um, allowed people to have a statewide popular vote. And that's how, that was the method of, of choosing um, electors a lot for the first hundred years of our country or almost hundred years, um, many state legislatures just picked the electors. I mean, we actually, in the beginning, if our state allowed us to vote for the house of representatives in, or the house of representatives in our state, we could vote in the U S house, but we couldn't vote for senators. We couldn't necessarily vote for president. We still don't vote for, for judges. So, you know, if they called it the people's house, it was this small sort of bit of democracy that they gave us. And we've since expanded it, but, I think the Electoral College has long um, outstayed its welcome. And there is, you know, the solution is to either do one of two things, is to pass uh, or to ratify an amendment, um, repealing it and changing it. Um, the current workaround is the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact. And what that would do is it would create, uh, uh, states would agree to give their electoral votes to the winner of the national popular vote rather than the popular vote winner in their state. And right now, I believe 15 states for a total of maybe 190 something electoral votes have signed on to this. Uh, if the total electoral votes breaks, hits 270, the compact takes effect. So this is a, this is a, a short term workaround. And, and there is an argument of whether, about whether or not it's constitutional, but until we were to pass an amendment, this would be the workaround for the, for the electoral college personally. Uh, I, uh, I think we should, you know, as we did with the 17th Amendment, uh, as we uh, uh, have done with expanding voting rights, you know, we have increased the amount of democracy in our country. Uh, and I think we should continue uh, uh, to do that by creating a, you know, a national popular vote. 
Well, good, great job. I agree with all that. You know, my, my first bill that I introduced when I was in the Maryland State Senate was the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact. And Maryland became the first state to initiate this movement to try to get us out of the Electoral College. And um, at least the way it's being practiced today, the this Electoral College has given us two popular vote losers in the last five elections, George W. Bush in 2000 and Donald Trump in 2016, both under the most suspicious circumstances. And the Electoral College makes the presidential election very vulnerable and malleable to special interest influence and corrupt mischief and manipulation. And we saw it in 2000 and we saw it in 2016 with um, the Russian attack uh, on our election. If you can, if you can essentially steal an election in one state, like in Florida, where um, the uh, the Secretary of State, who was supposed to be administering the election, doubled as the chairman of the George Bush for President campaign in the state. Now, if you can do that, then you can win 25 electoral college votes in Florida, for example. You could win the whole election that way, and that was an election which Vice President Gore won in the popular vote with around 600,000 uh, votes. And we all know that Hillary beat Trump by three and a half million votes. But the problems go way beyond even that. I mean, everybody knows that's the basic problem, that the winner doesn't necessarily win. And why shouldn't we elect the president the way we elect governors, U.S. senators, members of Congress and mayors, which is whoever gets the most votes win. Um, but Beyond that, we, we have a, a completely warped and distorted presidential election. Everybody knows going into um, 2020, for example, that the election will come down to six or seven, maybe at the most eight or nine states. That means the vast majority of Americans live in states that are safely blue states like Maryland or Rhode Island or New York or California or Hawaii or safely red states like Texas or Arkansas or Louisiana or North Dakota or Alaska or what have you. So most of the country becomes flyover territory and all of the money gets spent in a handful of states. That's where all of the campaign visits are. It's where all the TV ads go in there. It's where the offices are set up. I remember in 2008, I was uh, one of the co-chairs of the Obama campaign uh, because the, m most everybody else in the Democratic primary was going with Hillary Clinton. And um, uh, when it came to the general election, we were told we got no signs and no bumper stickers. And when we got volunteers, they had to be sent to Virginia. And when we got money, it had to be sent to Virginia. And that was a perfectly rational allocation of resources. But you see, it totally undernourishes politics in most of the country. So that's, you know, that's an additional problem beyond the corruption and beyond the fact that we don't have a majority rule. Jefferson himself said that the Electoral College was an ink blot on the Constitution. Um, and uh, I like one of the things I really like about the spirit of Ben's book is that he doesn't think founding fathers know best in all cases. In fact, the founding fathers didn't think founding fathers know best. Jefferson wrote this beautiful letter where he said he deplored the sanctimonious reverence with which some people treated the handiwork of the framers. He said, I was part of that generation and they were good people, but they were no greater than you and I. And they're, we're just like them, except we have the benefit of historical experience that they don't have. So we've got to think for ourselves moving forward. And as Ben says, the Constitution is becoming ever more democratic. And that is the counterweight to all of the authoritarianism and the racism and anti-Semitism, which we're getting out of the Republican Party. It's got to be con more constitutional democratization. Okay. So we have we have time for uh, one more question. And this is Virginia. She says, I teach sixth grade history. This spring, we are focusing on essential knowledge. What would you say is essential for 12 year olds to know about the Constitution? Well, I think the most essential thing to know is that, um, you know, this is something that is maybe at the outset, not meant to, wasn't designed to include everyone, um, but it should include everyone. And this is, this is something that it belongs to them at age 12, as much as it belongs to anybody else. I mean, this, this is something that was written for all of us 
and we have the, the right to know what's in it. And this is also, I should say, a good opportunity to mention that in January, there's a, a version of this book um, being released for, for ages eight to 12. Uh, so hopefully uh, that, um, uh, you know, the, those, those, those kids can, can, can read that version. But um, this, is, this is their country as much as anyone else's, despite the fact that they may be too young uh, to vote in it. And I spoke recently to a group of, of 16 and 17 year olds in Texas. And we were talking and, you know, they, they, they are following politics and they want to participate, but they're not old enough to vote. And I talked with them and I said, look, while you might not be able to vote right now, you know, if you're 17, you can pre-register in some states. If you're 16, you know, in, again, in Maryland, you can vote in certain uh, local elections, but you can still do a lot of other things uh, to participate in democracy. You can attend a town hall. Uh, you can, uh, you know, go with your parents to knock on doors. Uh, you can write postcards. Uh, you can follow your, your, your representatives on social media and tweet at them. You can, I mean, the list just goes on and on of the ways you can participate. And I think getting young people to participate in an early age um, in these ways that they can, even if they can't vote, will make them more informed voters and, and, and stronger and, and more uh, informed voters, more educated voters uh, when they have that ability. So I guess the one thing I would want them to know about the constitution is what, what it says, uh, how it works. Um, and it's something that uh, they, they, that was, was written for them and it's up to them to, to carry it forward and, and, and make it more perfect. And uh, well, that's a pretty good answer. I would, I would teach them three additional things. One is um, how revolutionary the document was in separating church from state before um, the American constitution was written. Uh, every government had been founded on a union between um, the church and state and um, the corruption of religion and the degradation of government and reason and science. Um, and so our enlightenment forebears uh, created a government that was a rebellion against centuries of religious warfare between the Protestants and the Christians in Europe, every bit as vicious as the wars between the, the Sunni and the Shia today, and against Inquisition and holy crusades and witchcraft trials and all that stuff. So teach them about that and teach them about equal protection and all of the different parts of the Constitution that bolster equal protection, like the No oh, Titles no. of Nobility Clause, uh, the first Constitution that wrote that the Congress cannot award titles of nobility like prince and king and count and all of that nonsense that we rebelled against, um, and the no, uh, no foreign emoluments, that not only did we not want a monarchy to emerge in America, we didn't want our presidents to be collecting emoluments from foreign princes, kings, and states. Um, you know, a, another basic precept of the American Republic that has come under withering pressure by the Trump administration as he makes deals with uh, dictators and monarchs all over the world uh, to enrich himself and his family. So, and the third thing I would teach them about, because nobody knows about it, and uh, it, it may be the most critical overlooked part of the Constitution today is the 25th Amendment, uh, and specifically uh, Section 4 of the 25th Amendment, which uh, even my colleagues don't read carefully enough because everybody thinks you need the cabinet to act. But actually what it says is that the vice president and a majority of the cabinet can determine that the president is unable for mental or physical reasons to discharge the powers and duties of office or the vice president and the majority of a body set up by Congress. And when I first got elected in 2017, I called over to the Library of Congress. I said, where is the body that was set up under the 25th Amendment? And they called me back like 45 minutes later and they said they never set the body up. And so uh, that was the first bill I put in as a member of Congress. I ended up getting 75 uh, colleagues on it, no Republicans, unfortunately, just not mentioning any particular president, not mentioning the current occupant, but just saying we need to have that body in place under the 25th Amendment, which, which was uh, introduced by some very thoughtful, smart people. Uh, Senator Birch Bayh was the lead proponent, but Senator Robert F. Kennedy uh, was um, his co-lead on it. And they basically said in the nuclear age, it's too dangerous. Um, that somebody could go missing or be in a coma or have a disabling stroke or psychotic break or something like that. We've got 535 members of Congress, so we can afford to have two or three of them 
go crazy, but we've only got one president and that's what the 25th Amendment's all about. Thank you both so much. Um, another real quick question before we go during these, during these uncertain times, I'm curious what books you're reading right now or what books you could recommend um, just, just out there, like, well, what are you getting into? Um, well, I've been reading two books. Uh, you know, part of part of this sort of deep dive into the, I guess, like the boiler room of democracy has called me to, caused me to now sort of turn to the the money side of of things and and campaign finance and and why uh, uh, you know certain influences are are so strong. So there are two books uh, that I'm reading. One. Uh, uh, I, I got an advanced copy of that comes out in a couple of uh, uh, weeks, which is called Unrig uh, by a guy named Daniel Newman. And he runs an organization called Maplight. And it's sort of, it's a graphic novel in the sort of way that, that I, I tried with this book to sort of take a different approach to um, you know, the constitution. He takes an unusual approach to democracy reform and he wrote a superhero style graphic novel all about uh, um, sort of democracy reform. And I really highly recommend that book. It's amazing. Um, and uh, lots of pictures for anyone who likes pictures. And also uh, the book Dark Money, uh, which I, I've, I'm way late to get to, uh, but getting around to. So, you know, just some really light uh, spring reading for me. Yeah. So well, I've got three books at my bedside. And one is the greatest book of moral and political philosophy ever written by my professor, Judith Schlar the late Judith Sklar called Ordinary Vices. Everybody's got to check it out if you have not. Um, a second is a, a book by Gary Wills called Head and Heart, which is a history of American Christianities um, and the relationship between the Christian church and religion, which is really fascinating. And then, of course, I've got uh, Ben Sheehan's um, fantastic new um, breakthrough book, uh, OMGF, WTF. <laughs> That was the conversation. I'm not sure I got the title right, but it's nailed it. And it's fantastic. So, um, and I also have I I, I should I you know I I'm I'm not just saying this. I did start reading a uh, 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 congressman's book, uh, We the Students, and uh, um, I I feel like I could have used a lot of this information when I was uh, when I was back in school. So um, that's also a really amazing book. Well, I'd like to thank you both so much for this. Just a fantastic. Uh, fantastic talk and conversation. Um, and I wanna thank everybody else for joining us tonight and being a part of this. It's your patronage is, is what enables us to bring you programming like this. And we cannot continue to host these types of events without the book sales to support them. And so with that, please click on that link below, purchase OMG WTF, does the constitution actually say? Um, we, we appreciate that. Um, you can also click on the button right up above that says politics and prose and look at what events we do have coming up. We have a whole list of, of events. Um, like tomorrow, William Drozdek, um, last president of Europe, is in conversation with Jim Hoagland at three o'clock. Um, and then also uh, Jung Pak becoming Kim Jong-un is on May 4th at 7 p.m. So join us for those um thank you so much for being here thank you both uh congressman raskin and ben Sheehan. it's been such a pleasure to have you thank you um and really quick i just want to add that if you have i see there are a lot of questions out there if someone wants to have uh, additional questions uh feel free to uh to tweet at me or send me a message it's that ben Sheehan on twitter and i just want to say again thank you so much i cannot imagine how uh, uh busy uh the congressman's schedule is right now so for you to take the time uh, uh and and join the conversation uh, means a lot and thank you for uh for all that you do on behalf of us my pleasure ben thanks so much to politics and pros too yes absolutely thank you both so much all right, y'all. Thank you kindly and stay well read.